praises to an almighty God that he's worthy of it all. How many of you have had an exhausting week? How many of you like are getting kids back in school and getting back into routines and sometimes it feels like it's crashing in, but you know what? He is worthy of our praise in every last ounce of it. He's in it, he's through it, he's got a purpose for it, and he's got a plan. Do not give up, church. Do not give up because we are we are ready to roll. And I'm telling you what, if you feel pushback, one of the reasons is because 21 days of prayer is yeah. right?
leading the next generation into something that's going to be great, I assure you. Hey, I want to um, take a moment real quick because uh, I just want to honor somebody who's in the house today. Um, she's a friend of mine, and she actually helped thrive uh, in our first three years so that we could literally be able to fund, finance this building and move into our home space. And God actually used her in the sense that we didn't know COVID was coming, but there was an urgency on my, my heart and the, staff, the, the, the board's part. And so we began 2019 uh, moving towards this building, knowing that there is something happening that we need to be prepared for. Well, COVID hit March 2020, and so we were able, we were positioned well in favor of the Lord to be able to transition into this building. But the heart of Miss Teresa DeMay over here is the one who made that happen. Love her, love her, love her so much. Uh, we met at ACPA for the first three years, and she allowed that to take place. And completely rent-free, we remodeled the place. She just said, use it as much as you want. Now, that's kingdom, right? Yeah. So yeah. Hey, I want to introduce, I want to actually uh, invite all of you as well to Israel in 2024, or the June 4th to the 14th. I want to invite you to come with me. We're going to have a great time. I guarantee you this is the best guy I have ever met. She's not only a historian, I mean deep historian, a Bible, biblical scholar. She helps theologians translate the New Testament, though it was written in Greek and that was a common language. Hebrew was also a language, so she helps translate from Hebrew into English. And there's a unique variation for that and a reason for that. You'll learn while you're in Israel if you come with me. But she also runs with archaeological uh, archaeologists there, so she knows all the interesting things that are going on current day in their excavating. So I want you to be a part of that. She is an intense teacher, like 10, 12 hours a day she can teach nonstop. She is a unique, one of a unique kind for sure. Uh, again, you'll need to register online and, uh, and live with purpose.church or church center app. Would you hand me that bag right there? Have something special. Have something else and someone else I want to introduce you today to today. And it's his birthday, by the way. We get to be here for his birthday. Uh, you've probably seen him on Comedy Central. You can find him on Amazon Prime. He is hilarious. I say he has been charged with restoring joy back to the church. Can the church laugh a little bit today? Would you invite Elijah Sandra? Called to missions. 
a lot of us feel too. And then when we really dig in, we find that, oh, it takes money to do missions. And then we look back to the things we're gifted at. I'm gifted at plumbing, and plumbing is how I make money to connect to my calling in missions. Does that make sense? It's that simple. And sometimes we want to over, you know, we want to overthink it, over spiritualize it, and, you know, and just, you know, and God's going to show up through an angel, and the angel's going to come out of the sky. And it's going to say, yeah, or you can go to work. <laughs> is the gifting that God gave me to get kicked out of class number one um, and then uh, and then later on in life to be able to open the doors to the things that I'm really called to do. And one of the things I'm really called to do is, is go into prisons and work with juvenile correctional centers all over the country um, and, and what, I've, what I've found is that even though that's a great calling and a great work and a lot of people really appreciate it, Southwest Airlines still needs their money. Okay. And so, so my goal when I go into a church is also to, to really expose what I do to, um, to because vision comes with through exposure, and if people don't know that they can't give, they can't contribute, they can't partner. And so there are different seasons in people's lives. There's seasons where you can go, there's seasons where you can send, or there's seasons where you can do either one or both. And I am in the season where I can go, and I've got a commission on my life and an assignment on my life to go. Um, and what I do and how I raise the money for that, the funds to do, to do that, is through partnership or through t-shirt sales or book sales, any profit that's donated. But everything I do is donation basis. So if you go to the table back there um, after the service, there's going to be little things that you can scan or you can see the little addresses where you can send money or you can just... Uh, if you want to help out. My goal, each trip takes about $750 to go on to complete all the finances for everything. Um, that's without me taking a profit at all. That's just me going and doing these things. And I work with, you know, on each trip, I'll work with a juvenile correctional center and a prison. I go in, I do free comedy shows, and I invite them for a chapel service and I share my testimony. And then I roll them into discipleship with a local church um, because their families are in the local community. So I want you to know it's not just me trying to reach the inmates. I don't, I don't even call to somebody, you'll try to reach their entire world. Yeah. And so, and so yeah. it's, it's me working with the families and connecting them to discipleship and churches. So it's a big program. I'd love to tell you about it. But if you're interested in that, my goal is to come out of here and I believe some can stand. And I'm asking those who are in here that ignites any good passion on the inside. You know, I know that's not going to be everybody. Listen, there's some people who you just have strong passion for, um, for missions. And you didn't have that until you went on a missions trip. You were exposed to that. You went on a missions trip. And then you came back and, and maybe, maybe the community was starving over there. And you came back with this passion. And with that passion, you're just like, a, you know, we get, we get excited. You know, I get excited. I want to talk about, and so maybe you came down to the passion of mission. You hear everyone's going to Chili's afterwards. You're like, Chili's, how dare you? There's people starving. You're like, well, I'm hungry too. And yeah, so, so, so there's different levels that people, you know, and so me, I'm very passionate about this, and it ignites within you. It's not going to be everyone's cause, but it is our responsibility to ignite that. I say all that because my grandpa, and this is part of the message, let's go ahead and pray so that way you'll know it's officially the message. <laughs> Father God, help us. Amen. Um, my, my grandpa, my grandpa died in prison. He spent his life in prison. I only had uh, a week-long experience with my grandpa when he was out on parole one time. And uh, my nana, uh, I, I believe she sent him back to prison. And <laughs> make no mistake, she was no better. I come from shady roots. And, and my, my grandpa, so I'm half Mexican, half white boy, that's the Mexican side uh, of me, I'm half Mexican, half, any, any brown crowds in here? Right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, that's um, I, 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 I am half Mexican, half white boy, which means I hire myself for a lot of jobs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is called testing the crowd. <laughs> so my grandpa, he was in prison. And a guy that was serving time with him, skipping from the back of the neighborhood, a um, little area that my family was all from. Uh, Skippy got out of prison, and while he was in prison, a uh, 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 group came in and shared the gospel with him. And Skippy gets out, and he's hardcore. He's like, you know, my grandpa, his generation goes, I'm talking about the, the old Cholos. Uh, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. There's a certain thickness to the mustache. You know what I'm talking about? Just that certain, uh, there's a height to the, the way. Men make an interesting choice with our pant line. Um, we, we, we decide either we're going to wear it down here and brag about that we have the same waist size since high school and ignore that our gut is hanging over the thing. <laughs> or we 
we make the decisions where it comes up higher and higher. So if you're from Los Angeles, where all my family's from, and you're Hispanic, the pants go higher and higher and higher. And, we, and, and we, we wear big in the waistline. You know, if you wear a 34, you're wearing a 44. You know, like, and they, they go up and up and up. The older you get, the higher you get. And some of the old cholos in there is like, hey, I, my Uncle Hobbit, he's in his 80s. I saw him two months ago. And he was like, oh, yeah, the weather's hot out there, isn't it?
And I said, well, let me look at this. Because he was all, you know, yeah, I can't watch my shows anymore. And I said, well, why not? He said, because we got the new system. And that's how we respond a lot of times to new systems. And, and I said, well, let me see the I said, the remote. And, and I told him, oh, look, no, all you have to do is press this input button three times. That's it. And it goes to the right channel. And he goes, oh, no, no, I, I can't do this. Not, and I, I tried to explain to him over and over. And, and he would not embrace... Our, the, the, the simple comprehension of all you have to do is make a few adjustments and you can be living where it is that you want to live. Right. You can experience the things and take in the things that you want to think. But he said something. This is what caused this whole message to happen. He said something that was very profound. He said, well, about the fifth time I'm trying to show you, he, he just put the remote down. He goes, it's too late. <laughs> That's the conclusion. It's too late. Now I, I'm not a tech savvy guy, but I know that this is all you have to do. Now, he just embraces the fact that there's no way to do this anymore, and so he's given up. And what God sent me here today is to remind some people that are watching online and in the room that he knows how to make and show you how to make those few adjustments yeah. of areas in your life. And sometimes we just say, no, it's too late because we're not experiencing or because we this, this new thing or because, and here's the hardest part, is we feel like we really double down on it's too late when we deal with it's my fault and I did something wrong. The disqualification feeling that we have, that it's too late to accomplish or achieve or, or, or get back on course um, and be used by God, maybe in an area, because we truly did wrong and it's too late. Um, interesting thing that God said in his word says this, it says that God's giftings and his callings are without repentance. And what that means is that God is not sitting up in heaven watching us having failed and saying, oh, well, I'm sorry I ever gave them the call. Yeah. He's not repentant of it. He's not apologizing to anybody for his gifting and his calling to be on our life. And he knew that we would have areas of struggle in this life. That's why he's released to us the power of the Holy Spirit to help lead us, yeah. guide us, and direct us, and navigate us through these yes. struggles. Yes. But we oftentimes think because this happened, it's too late. And our response is so often, it's too late. <laughs> and we just double down. There's a guy named David in the Bible. We find him in 1 Samuel chapter 30, down in verse 6. Uh, some of you are worried I want to get into the scripture. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. We find, we find David at a time when he is feeling like it is too late. We find him at a, at a season where it's just like, what has happened to this guy? Because when we met David, this, I love the story of David, because David catches us in different areas of our life. David catches us in high moments, in great moments, in glorious moments, and in very low moments. That's why I believe the Bible, because the Bible leaves you in the shady parts. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The Bible leaves you in the parts that I need to see. So that way I can say, oh, okay, well, if God's cool with him, then God's probably cool with me, too. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and come back to God on that one. Yeah. And David is like that. David, he does glorious things, but David also liked the ladies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, David, David, has, David has things going on. <laughs> and yet God called him and appointed him and anointed him. There was a king named Saul, the first king. Yeah. And God actually called this king. God actually appointed this guy, first king of Israel, over God's people. And then David comes along, and uh, God tells the man of God and the prophet in that land, he said, hey, go, and I want you to go to this place, and there's a, there's a guy, he's going to be the next leader. And so he goes, and he looks through all the people, and then he finds David just working in the field with his dad's sheep, and he said, yeah, that's the guy. And so he anoints it, he anoints David for ministry, because he calls so from this young teenage, I mean, David's just a teenage, squirrely little guy, you know what I'm saying? David probably doesn't even have his real voice yet, David's got those weird wonky legs, he's just, 
He's out there tending to the field. And even everyone, look, even David's dad's like, well, I got one other day. Surely it can't be this kid you're talking about. And David's like, this is me. And this, this, this is the one. And, and the, the man of God anoints him. And David goes back to work. And that's, that's the thing we should do. We're anointed to do something. All right, get back to work. But I'm anointed. Yeah, get back to work. Because that's, right. that's where we prove ourselves. Right. That's where, that's where we, we learn the character building. That's where we learn what it's going to take. We think it's hard work now when we're fully in it. Listen, this is David's being prepared. And so then David, the next time we see him, and this is very important in this story, the next time we see David, David is coming with some breadsticks and some snacks that his dad sent to the brothers who were all in the Israelite army, okay? And, and David's out there tending the field. They're nearby, and David comes up, and guess who he sees? The giant pickle. Betty Till. Betty Till. David comes up to this guy named Goliath. Goliath is a literal giant. He's a giant man. And David is a teenage boy. And this giant man is out there cursing out the army of the Lord. He's out there making fun of them. He's out there. He doesn't have a covenant with God. He's out there. And David can't believe his eyes. You know, these teenage boys, you know how they are. They're like, man, come on, who this guy is? That, like, David's right. out there. He's thinking, what's, who's going to fight? Let's come on, get out of this. And, and David's brother's like, man, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you even doing here? You have nothing to do with this. And David's like, you guys aren't going to fight this guy? This guy's not even, he doesn't even have a covenant with God. He's cursing out our God. Our God of the universe. He's coming. And, and, and David can't believe it. And David says something. He says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And, and David's brother is like, man, just go away. And so David starts asking, okay, what's going to happen to the guy who defeats this giant? And so one of the soldiers says, well, you know um, Saul, the king? You know that daughter of his? You get her? And David was like, you had me and that daughter of his. <laughs> <laughs> And David goes out there, and David fights Goliath. David beats Goliath. He has a slingshot. He beats him, boom, and the slingshot, the, the rock hits Goliath right in the, the opening of his, his helmet. Goliath falls, boom, like that. David does a very teenage boy thing. He grabs Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. You know, it doesn't say it, but he probably picks his head up and does a puppet show, too. <laughs> on David's life. You know, there's certain reasons their people are drawn to you. It's because of the anointing on your life. And when you look around and see, oh my, you know, why are these people, why is it always these people? Those are your people. You're the magnet because there's something on, there's a reason God placed you in this generation right now and held you back for thousands of years and only released you into the atmosphere of this earth right now because the very things sometimes that we're frustrated with so much are the very reasons we're here because we hold within us the power to change those things. And we wouldn't have been released in another time. Oh, I'd love to be in another time. If I could be in another time, it'd be in the old West days. And I'd walk around. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. I know it's in your head. You think that. But when you walked in here, you were thankful for the air conditioner. You wouldn't have worked in another generation. I'd love to, see, I'd love to be back in the Bible days. No, you wouldn't. You know what you love? Plumbing and sewage. But you love. And David is built for exactly when he came out, so people started being drawn to David. People started even following David. And then David would go to war, because he became such a great warrior, he would go to war with, with the chosen army of the Lord, and Saul, the king, is starting to get jealous. Because the women, literally says this, the women are writing songs about, the, they, say, they, they wrote the song, it said, Saul has slain his thousands. Saul's like, yeah, you write about that? Slain my thousands. But Saul didn't like the next verse. Because the next verse said, but David is tens of thousands. Saul's like, who does this? Are you crazy? 
This kid is getting with the better hairline. This kid without the pot belly. He, this is the guy who's getting more attention. Don't you know I'm the man? And David didn't want to do anything wrong. So David starts, his soul starts to try to kill David. Now, some of you in this room have felt a resistance in life for reasons that you don't even know. Like you're just, you didn't even ask to be here. And you're just trying to do the right thing. And all of a sudden there's an attack on your life. All of a sudden there's just constant battling that you're having to go through in different areas. And you're like, I didn't even ask. David didn't even ask to, to be called. David didn't ask to be king. David was appointed and anointed to, for this position. And in life, we think a lot of times we get resistance because we're doing something wrong. But a lot of times we get resistance because we're doing something right. Yeah. And we never asked for it. And it's getting heavy on David. So David spent seven years gathering people to him, the, the mighty men of David, the warriors that would fight, all their wives, all their children, they're, they're all traveling with David, and David is hiding out, running from Saul because he doesn't want to do the wrong thing and touch and kill and respond to Saul. Even though Saul is doing the wrong thing, David wants to stay in the right standing. He's like, I don't want any trouble. I don't. And finally, David gets tired. Now, David, here's where we find him. David finds a group of people that he hasn't seen in seven years. And that's, that people group is called the Philistines. The Philistines is where we found Goliath. Remember the giants? That was the Philistine army. Okay? So David, having started by fighting the Philistine army, now finds himself in a position to make a deal with the Philistine army to go in and stay at the section of land that they'll let them stay in. It's called Ziklag. Him and all his people can stay there and hover there and as long as they will agree to fight on the behalf of the Philistine army whenever these guys go out and fight. So David is now fighting on behalf of the people who he used to fight against. And this yeah. is a big sign. Whenever we start getting tired, whenever we start getting frustrated, whenever we're like, you know what, I just, I quit. Because David thinks he's down that moment. With God, where it's just like, you know what, I, I don't want any of this. I didn't ask for this. I just give up. I quit. And a lot of you, and I have, I for sure, I quit ministry so many times. And God's like, all right, I'll be here when you're waiting. You know, I mean, just, uh, here, here, here um, just come to pick it back up. The mantle's on you still. And David is tired and he finds himself now fighting on the side of the things he used to fight against. And I think that's a big indicator for our lives. Yes. Some of us have fought so hard in the past to get freedom from some things. And then along the path, we find ourselves now fighting, fighting for the right to include those things in our lives still. And we start fighting on the other side, and we realize that, wait a minute, this was something that I was delivered from. Not, not delivered, delivered so I could do this again, be on this side of things. And David's just there. He's tired. He's tired. You know? And, and I don't blame him. I don't blame him. It's been seven years. He's been running. Someone's trying to kill him. And he's there for a year and a half. He's his bad. Him and his people. And they come up against this army. David, uh, the Philistines come up against this army. And it's the Israelite army. This is where David, this is where David's called. David's called to lead this army. And now David started going to have to, go to fight God's army. With the Philistines. The Philistines are like, wait a minute, isn't this where we met David? Send those guys back to camp. That we don't want them on. We're going to fight us from the inside. And so then David goes back with his people and they crest the hill and and they come over. You ever seen that scene in Mulan? Where 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 the whole town is burnt down, you know, and they pick up the little doll and, and this is what David comes back to. When David and his army were out there fighting. And got turned back. Another army came in and burnt down their city, yeah. burnt down their village, yeah. and stole all the wives and all the children. Everything is gone. Yeah. And it's not just David's, it's everyone who followed David. And this group of people were like, We started following you because you had God's call on your life, and now we've lost everything. 
because we were following you and because you were the one who chose to pull the plug. We fought harder, we're more worn out than we've ever been, and now we've lost everything. And so now all these people are speaking of stoning David. This is a big deal. This isn't like, you know, um, some people in the Walmart parking lot talking bad about you. <laughs> these are warriors. These are these guys can kill anybody, and they're talking about killing David. This is where we find David in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6. Here we are. We're, we're nine years in, almost nine years into David's life. And we've seen David just trying, just trying. And we see good moments, sparks of good moments, but if you're in that, if you're in that nine years, See, we, we read the Bible like, oh, David, silly David, three verses down, you're going to be fine. <laughs> but we don't read it as if it's like our real life. Because a lot of times we're in the middle of the story. In the middle of the story, we don't know it's only three verses. Because that three verses seems a long time. And there might be people in here that you're just, you're just tired. And it feels like it's too feel like it's too late because when you're honest with yourself, the things that are lost are a consequence to the things we've done wrong. And that's where it makes us feel like, God can't use me anymore because I'm the one who did this. I'm the one who... The importance here of what David is about to do that shifts everything. The press the input button three times and everything starts to reset. And you can start to go on with the thing that you want to do, the freedom that you want to walk in again. The importance here in verse 6 is extreme in our life. David does something we haven't seen him do in a year and a half. Interesting, this timeline is the year and a half where we find there are no psalms written from David. That time when he was going to just take a break, his song, st his song stopped. His reaching out, his gifting that God gave him, he just stopped everything, and we got a pause in his life, and it didn't go right. Some of us are taking time off from a relationship with God and unplugging because we don't understand what happened here, we don't understand, and we think it's going to work out better, and, and and it doesn't. It gets harder. And we see David in verse six, and it says it's something interesting. It says that David heard them talking, and he figured it out. It says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah. David stirred himself in the Lord. Notice it says, himself. Yes. David had to take an act of faith, yes. an action step, and do something that he hasn't done. He hasn't felt like it. A lot of times we wait for those moments where like, we feel like doing something. You know what I'm talking about? But I love it. I, love, I was raised in, around old school revivals. My daughter would drag. I mean, when I say drag, she would drag me to the old school revival. She said, Mijo, come on. You're not going to die and go to hell like your parents. Let's go to hell. And, and she would drag me. And I love that she would, you know, I mean, she'd have those, those Holy Ghost goosebumps, like that kind of stuff. And I love those moments. But this isn't the moment that looks like that. David doesn't feel any of that. There's no glory upon him. David stirred himself in the Lord. And I believe today God sent me because there are people who you need to just decide you're going to serve God anyway. You're going to say it's not too late for this part of your dream, this part of your goal, this part of your... You're, you're going to say, I'm stirring myself up in this thing. I'm not going to wait on a feeling. I'm going to move as if it's already here. I'm going to call those things that are not yet as though they were. And I'm going to speak in faith over this thing. Rather than just assuming it's just it's falling apart. How the story ends is God gets back involved. Navigates David and his army. They get everything restored to them and more as a result of David taking this action step. And I believe that's what God wants to do today. But I believe we're, we're bombarded with this thought that we are, because we're falling apart in areas, that that can't happen. I wonder if the butterfly ever looks at the caterpillar with that disdain, thinking, oh, can't believe you're in that stage. Or if they realize that we have to go through that stage. 
We forget that that little caterpillar, it, it was born and it's just crawling around. And, and it didn't ask to be here. It's just like, oh, I'm going to get to that tree in about two weeks. <laughs> and then along the route to that tree, it seems like it gets worse because they come to a complete stop and then a complete isolation and build this cocoon around them. And in the cocoon, you would think, oh good, finally they get a breather. Nay, they start literally melting away. They're, everything falls apart. And if you just ask the, ask the category during that stage, hey, how you doing in life there, buddy? He'd be like, oh, that's so good. Like, you know? <laughs> And maybe you're in that stage and you think because you feel like you're falling apart right now that, that this is the end. But I'm telling you, three verses down, just, just a little past this part of your story is when you realize it was necessary. You had to go through this breakdown. Yes. In order, you had to go through the isolation period in order to really develop into what's on the inside of you, the transformation that Romans 12, 2 talks about. You have to go through this part in order to come out with wings on the other side. Come and on. now that tree that used to take two weeks to get to, you can fly within seconds to. And, and you don't look with the stain on the caterpillar going through that season. I believe that we're all in one of those stages of life. And if you're in here and your wings are sprouted and you're vibrant, you're cobra, don't forget to encourage the caterpillar that's going through all, I mean, it's going through everything just trying to get by. Or don't, don't, don't forget to discourage, you know, encourage and just speak into the ones who are in isolation. Say, hey, you're not going to believe what you're going about to be like. It's going to be better than it is now. It's going to be better than it ever was before. I believe God sent me here. God work this whole thing out because there's someone who feels like in your life it's too late yeah. and you don't realize that you're just in the cocoon right now and this is all part yeah. of the development and you're going to fly again you're going to go beyond and vision's going to happen in a way it never has before and people are going to see you shine once again yes. that's what's going to be your story it's not too late it's good. It's only a matter of a few adjustments. You begin by stirring yourself in the Lord. What does that look like to you? It, it may look like you getting with God in prayer, in the focus of prayer. It may look like you getting with God in worship. It may look like you picking up your art and your gift again. I don't know what it looks like, but I know it's something that God sent me to do. Here's what I'm asking everyone to do. As everyone just bow your hands, close your eyes real quick. The only reason I ask you to do this is just to create a private moment. Uh, between you, me, and God. Uh, whenever I'm somewhere, I never like to leave without the opportunity that I'm given to, uh, to just introduce people that don't know my God to my God. And that's through a relationship and embracing of His Son, Jesus, who paid a great price at the cross and laid down His life. And you may think, well, I, I, I have a nudge on my heart, a tug on my heart, and I just don't know all the details. Friend, Welcome to the club. None of us know all the details. None of us can understand at all. Or we're progressing at different levels in this. Every one of us. If you're in here and you say, Elijah, I've never said a prayer asking Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Uh, but I want to do that. Never done that. And you're in here. I want to just lead you in a prayer. Or maybe you're in here and you'd say, Elijah, I have done that. But if I'm honest with myself, things are not where they need to be. Things are kind of off course, and I know God's never turned his back on me. He's never left me or forsaken me, but I've allowed myself to be filling up a division from him. And I want to just press the reset button on my spiritual journey, and, and I want to say this prayer with those who may be saying it for the first time. I just want to press reset. The Bible says this is mercies are fresh and new every day. I need that day to be today. I'm not going to ask anyone to... Uh, you know, come up here and share your testimony. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I, just, I want to know who I'm praying with. So on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand in the air. And I'm going to, I'm going to say a prayer out loud. And we're all going to pray together. And, uh, and we're going to celebrate together. If that's you on the count of three, you ready? One, two, three. If that's you, just shoot your hand. I see your hand right here. I see your hand right here. I see your hand right here. I see your hand back right there. As soon as you put it up, you can put it right back down. I see your hand. I see your hand. Awesome. Here's what I'm going to ask everyone to do. I'm going to ask everyone in this room. 
Just say this prayer after me. Say it out loud. Everyone, not just you raise your hand. Say this prayer out loud and say it loud enough for you to hear yourself say it. Say, Father God, Father God I need you in my life. I, in my life. I can't make it on my own. Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Fill me with your spirit. And I'll follow you every day of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would y'all give it up for Elijah Taylor? Hey, also, in, the spirit of, in the spirit of our 21 days of prayer, I want to continue to just model prayer for you so that you can be more confident at, as you're getting those 21 days of, of devotional. So remember the Pray First app. Even if you'll show that Pray First app, I'm inviting you to download. And here's a little, uh, here's my screenshot of my video, my, my phone, so I easily can go in and find your Pray First app. There's several models of prayer to just coach you along, to, if you can scale alongside biblical prayers. We're choosing the prayer of Jabez today, and you can just pause, or actually just continue to play it. As you select these different points of prayer, uh, the Church of the Highlands has actually put together these prayer models and the why behind that different prayer steps. And the first thing that Jabez prays for is a blessing. The second was influence. Third being presence and then protection. If you just hold it right there in bed, in First Chronicles 10 and 4, you'll find this prayer of Jabez. Jabez, is, it's in his lineage of names. And Jabez literally means born in pain. Could you imagine, hey, my name is, I'm a pain in the rear. That's my name. It kind of goes along with David's a little bit of a pain. A time of pain. You're in a time of pain, most likely. Or maybe God has given you so much vision, and the thought of even trying to go after that creates pain inside of, I don't know if that's even possible. But God. And no matter where you are in that space or, or that place or you've given up on it or you went after it and it got too tough and you're kind of in this way of place of doubt, but God showed you and God told you and God has confirmed it, he's affirmed it, and somewhere in that space we tend to in our humanity get in the way of ourselves and we're wondering can this still take place? And Jabez in this place, because he is a, 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 a un, un Unglorious type of man. I mean, a small family. How would this happen? But he said, if only you, Lord. But if only you would bless me. And Lord, if only you would just bless me. Not just for me, but the resources and what's required to be an overflow of blessing to the, into the lives of those who you want me to affect. How about this, as you're praying this week, Lord, oh Lord, that you would bless this house. That you would bless my house, that you would bless my children, that you would bless my health, Lord. That you would strengthen me, not so that I would be strong, Lord, but that I could be a, a vessel of use for you and your kingdom to move it forward. Father, let it be that the things that you bless me with are for the sake of others, and it just happens to be that I get to benefit from that too. That's a blessing of the Lord. That's a prayer that comes for the Lord, from the Lord, and unto you, through you, for the sake of others. You want to be blessed, that's the type of blessing, the prayer, a prayer you start to pray. That it's, I, that I be blessed, Lord, but it's for the sake of others. And that you would give me influence, that you would give me influence into my spouse's, family, spouse's life again, that you would give me influence in my children's life again. Lord, help me restore the relationship with my children, wherever you are. Help me restore that relationship. Lord, that you would help me and give me influence into the lives of others in my small group that I'm going to be a part of. And as, I'm, as I'm leaning into work, as I'm going into to work this week, Lord, give me influence where I had no influence and help me to see it ever so clearly. Holy Spirit, speak to me in the right moments so that I can impart something of wisdom and truth into a relationship and then reinvest back into something that was hurt or lost. This is how we pray this week. This is how we pray during the 21 days of prayer. That I may have influence in the lives of others. Not for me, but for the sake of you and your kingdom, Lord. And Lord, let your presence be with me. Don't let me go if you're not going. Don't let me get out of this time of devotion until you show up and you manifest your glory. And that I truly know and I can sense your presence because you're taking me and my thoughts beyond me and my desires. Amen. 
And Lord, as you give me the influence and you're blessing me, Father, let your presence just be so known, made known into the lives of others. Because, Lord, I don't want it just for me. I don't want it just for my house also. But I want it for the others that I'm coming into contact with. Lord, I want it for the church that you called me to. Let this church be blessed. Let it be full of influence for the community. Let your presence fall upon it so others can feel your glory. And Lord, as we're going and we're being on mission for it, Father, protect us. Protect us from the things that we can't see. Protect us from the things that we can't see. Lord, protect us from anything of the work of the enemy ever coming into contact with us. And Lord, let us be made known. Let it be made known that we understand that you are defending all things that otherwise would have come through. But because of your presence, because of the blessing, because of the end. And because of the call of God on my life, and I'm walking it out. Amen. There you go. There's some prayer. Can I get a hand? Amen. Oh, so I'm, as you go through each day, choose one of these prayer models from this app and just choose to walk it out and then apply the different devotional points that we're attacking each 21 days. Put your own context in there and then just watch God begin to, to do a work and believe what you're hearing Him say.
This is the word of God. This isn't Stephanie talking. This is the word of God that's got power on it. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. All right, if you've got a tithe in the house, let's just raise the tithe. We're so thankful for just the, um, the work of God in our lives. We've got great ways for you to participate in giving online, or you can actually do the old school, write the check and slip it in the envelope and put it in the box and back. But in the meantime, we bless this tithe, Lord. We give back to you what is yours. And we thank you that we get to participate in kingdom building. And we bless this tithe back to the church, back to you, and may be used for your kingdom purposes in Jesus' name. Hey, you all have a great day, and we can't wait.